Good morning, I'm Kevin Mullins. It's a beautiful day here in Malmesbury and it's very early so I probably look like a bag of nails. I apologise for that but I want to get this video done today and then go off and do some stuff for the kids and I've got some weddings to edit so doing this as early as I can to get it up online. It's going to be a pretty quick video. Ever since I put my review of the X100F online, I've had lots and lots of questions about the settings I use for weddings and street, etc, etc. You know what, the settings are pretty much the same throughout. So I'm going to go through the whole of the settings of my camera, I'm going to talk about why I set things up a certain way, and the benefits, and maybe show some pictures. And the second question I've been asked the most is, am I going to do another book? So this is the book I wrote for the X100S, it's by Pearson. And sadly the answer is no, because Pearson as a publishing company have stopped making books about mirrorless cameras. So I'm not going to be in the position to write another book, which is really sad, I would like to do it. I'd actually started writing one, the opportunity's gone away. Maybe there's another publisher out there that will come forward, who knows. I really don't have the ability or the financial clout to self-publish something like this, where it would have to be done properly. So sadly at the moment the answer is no. But obviously you can keep coming to my website, f16.click, where I'm putting up lots of content and more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, let's get into the settings. The thing to remember with these settings is that they are my settings. They may work for you, they may not work for you, but I wanted to just go through them because so many people have asked me exactly how I set up the camera. I'm gonna go through the settings sequentially where possible. Might show some images to explain. I'm gonna start with the image size setting which as you can see I have mine set to 16 by 9 ratio. This is because at the moment I like shooting my JPEGs to use in photo films. So 16 by 9 is great for widescreen. The number on the right there you can see 6354 indicates how many images will be recorded on your memory card at that resolution. This only affects JPEGs by the way. So if you're shooting RAW then these are pretty much irrelevant. If you're shooting RAW plus JPEG you'll see that your RAW files when you import them into Lightroom will already be cropped at that ratio, but the actual RAW file itself will be full size. The image quality setting is pretty straightforward. Fine plus RAW will give you full size JPEGs plus a RAW file. Those of you shooting JPEG will probably just leave this up fine. The RAW recording setting I think is something that confuses some people. You have two options, uncompressed and lossless compressed. There is absolutely no difference in the image quality of a lossless compressed image compared to uncompressed. Hence the name lossless. The reason you have these options is because some editing software does not support compressed files. For example, Lightroom does and Capture One doesn't. Hopefully that will change with Capture One in the future because it is a great editing software. For me, as a Lightroom user, it makes sense to use compressed files. It brings the raw files down from about 50 meg to around about 25 meg. And I can't think of any reason not to shoot compressed raw when using the Adobe systems. So on to the film simulations, and those of you who already have an X100F will know full well that there is now the beautiful Acros black and white film simulation, as well as all the others such as Classic Chrome, Astia, Velvia, etc. I shoot a lot of black and white, and almost all of my family and personal photography is shot using the Acros film simulation. I think it's just gorgeous. It's deep, it's rich, it's got a very, very lovely filmic tone to it. This particular image is a straight out of camera JPEG and I'll go through the settings that I use to create images like this shortly. My X100F is almost always set to record in the Acros film simulation. Relevant to the film simulation option is the grain effect, which will only affect your JPEG files of course. I don't recommend switching this on when you're shooting in Acros because the Acros film simulation has a built-in grain. However, if you wish to have a more filmic look to some of the other film simulations, you can set it here. Personally, I would probably add grain in post-production if I was going to add it. The next setting worth discussing is dynamic range. I'm a big believer in allowing the camera to do what it's meant to do, and so normally I will leave this at auto. Essentially, by doing this, I'm letting the camera decide what the best dynamic range setting is. It's going to do this by controlling the ISO to a certain extent, and essentially it's going to try and recover details in the highlights and the shadow areas where I need them. I really allow the camera to do this, especially when I'm shooting weddings. I don't want to set the camera to something like 400 dynamic range when I'm shooting outside to recover those details and then move into a church where the setting should probably be a little bit lower so the camera does it best for me. That said, there's perfectly valid reasons why you'd set this manually, especially if you're shooting perhaps a seascape or a very high contrast area, you might want to control this yourself. And the same is true for white balance, to be totally honest with you. It's very rare that I'm going to change that from auto. 
especially when I'm out shooting on the streets or in really good light. I mean, the Fuji files are great. The white balance on those machines are superb. And really only in certain conditions am I going to set those white balances manually. At weddings, pretty much the only time I'll do this is during the first dance or when the light is highly changing. I'm going to set that manually. Now, remember, again, this is just the way that I work. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way, but it's the way that's worked for me since 2012 when I started using the Fuji cameras. The next thing we're going to talk about is things like highlight tone and shadow tone, sharpness, etc. And I think really it's these settings that a lot of people struggle with. Remember that the highlight tone, shadow tone, all of those kind of settings, sharpness, noise reduction, etc., they only affect your JPEG files. So if you're shooting RAW, these are pretty much irrelevant, except that you will get a good accurate preview on the LCD or the EVF. That said, these are the base settings for pretty much all of my JPEGs. Really what I want to try and do is create a S-curve in the camera, just like I might do in Lightroom or Photoshop later. And to that end, I will use minus two for the highlight tone. And by doing that, I'm basically saying to the camera, look, I want you to protect the highlights within reason. And when I set the shadow tone to plus two, I'm basically saying to it, you know, I really want you to be quite contrasty. I want you to make a image with quite a bit of punch where the darks are fairly dark, um, but I'm not setting it to plus four because that's a little bit overkill for me. So plus two on the shadows is perfect and minus two on the highlights is perfect too. Of course, not in every circumstance is this going to be good for you. And really, it's a starting point for me. Like I say, it's really trying to emulate that S-curve that we might get in Lightroom later. The sharpness setting is also very relevant here. I want to give this image a little bit of bite. I want to make it as crisp as possible, which will give me less to do in post-production later. I think the sharpness settings in the Fuji X-Trans system are amazing, to be totally honest with you. And when you see the JPEGs that come out of it with that plus two shadows, with the plus two on the sharpness, it's not overly done, but it makes really, really beautiful images. The other attribute to look at when creating the JPEGs is the noise reduction setting. I will typically, for the X-Trans 3 sensors, have this set to minus two. I think it's true that in the previous generations of the sensors, there was this element of uh, waxy skin tones. Fuji have given us a much more granular approach to noise reduction now, and we can actually set it down to minus four. Minus four is about as close as we're going to get to off having no noise reduction done in the camera whatsoever. Although I believe that minus four still applies a little bit. So I kind of go in the middle, minus two. I'm liking the results that I'm getting at minus two. Definitely no more waxy skin tones, but I do want the camera to do some work when I'm shooting at those higher ISOs. The next relevant setting for me is color space. And this seems to be almost as contentious as the Mac versus PC debate. I basically go for sRGB for a couple of reasons. My monitor is an sRGB monitor color space. My album manufacturer uses sRGB color profiles. And going through Adobe RGB, yeah, okay, you're going to get a little tiny wider color gamut, but you're then going to have to convert it back to sRGB for any web display or printing, etc. So for me, sRGB works. So onto the focus area. And I'm very much a focus and recompose type shooter. I always have been. I use back button focusing and pretty much I keep my focus point in the center and I keep it at the smallest focus point. Again, there are a lot of good reasons why you might want to move the focus point around. But for me, when I'm working really, really quickly, I just want to have this focus point in the center and I don't need to worry about it. I can definitely work quicker by doing focus and recompose. And when I'm shooting fast moving subjects, especially at weddings, it's really important to be able to shoot really, really quick. I leave the AF point display to on. This is only really relevant for those using continuous focus in zone or wide tracking mode. When I use continuous focus, I leave AF mode in single point. And this is something to do with the focus and recompose methodology. And the fact really that I'm only ever in continuous focus mode for things like bridal recessional or even fast moving hugging scenes which if we're lucky happen at all weddings. And I really find using that single point for continuous focusing really useful in times like this. Zone tracking has its place, of course, especially when chasing pigeons around Trafalgar Square. The AF plus MF setting I leave to on because I always want to have the option to override the autofocus with manual focus just by turning the focus ring. Related to that setting is the focus peak highlighting, MF assist. I have mine set to red high all the time. A key setting for me and as you can see in this clip 
As I move the manual focus ring around, the focus peak highlighting indicates where the focus point will be. I find this useful when zone focusing on the streets. You can see the distance indicator at the bottom there moving while I focus, which is perfect if you just want to shoot at a certain distance away from you. I'll sometimes use this at weddings also in really low light, or if I'm trying to focus through something like a window and the AF is getting a little bit confused, I can override it with the manual focus and the peaking highlights really help. Even though I mostly focus and recompose, I still set the interlock spot AE and focus area to on. My camera is in spot metering mode probably 80% of the time. So even on the occasions that I do move the focus point, I really want the camera to be metering from that area. Having this setting switched on means that if you do move the focus point and you're in spot metering, the camera will meter from the focus point itself rather than metering from the center of the sensor. I'm a big fan of spot metering and using the light in the scene to make an image perhaps a little bit more dynamic. And I think this works really well with across black and white film simulation images. The instant AF setting is something that often leads to a little bit of confusion, I think. That's because it's only relevant in manual focus mode. This setting essentially tells the camera what to do when you press the AFL mode button. Now, I have my AFL button set to the rear command dial, and I'll explain why a little bit later. I have my instant AF setting set to AFS for single, and the reason for that is because when I press the AFL button, I want it to lock focus rather than continually focus. Habitually, I've just popped the camera into the continuous focus mode on the side, which works great for me. But I know some people who like to have this set to AFC. This can be particularly useful if you're using high speed burst in the drive mode, as you can essentially use continuous focusing without actually switching to the C mode on the camera. Try it, see how you get on. For those of you that do use continuous focus, you'll definitely want to look at the release focus priority setting. I have mine set to focus for AFS priority and release for AFC priority. What I'm saying to the camera is, when you're in single shot mode, make sure that you lock focus before taking the picture. When you're in continuous priority, I want you to concentrate on releasing the image. Shutter response is prioritized over the focus. When I am in continuous focus mode, I half depress the shutter button to let the camera start tracking and then depress it to start the shooting. In release priority, it's not gonna slow the camera down by trying to focus on every single shot. For me, this is probably one of the most important settings for continuous shooting. The next setting worth talking about is photometry, which is metering to you and I. I have the default set to spot, because as I mentioned earlier, I shoot in spot metering probably 80% of the time, so it makes sense for my camera to be set to spot when I'm ready to shoot. It's second nature now for me when I'm using the X100F and the spot metering system. I'll use the command dial on the back to lock the focus and I'll half depress the shutter to lock the exposure. This gives me a very, very easy way of quickly changing the exposure, changing the metering, changing the way this, the camera is seeing the light and hopefully making the picture that I want. As I said, having the camera ready set up in spot metering is a good place for me to start. You'll likely already know the difference between the shutter type options in the X100F the mechanical shutter and the electronic shutter. My default setting is the mechanical shutter and to be 100% honest with you, I very, very rarely use the electronic shutter on the X100F. The reason for that is because I have the ND filter if I really wanna just shut out a little bit of light. I don't necessarily need to go to the really extended or very fast shutter speeds. As with all the other X100s that came before it, the shutter sound is pretty quiet as it stands, so I don't really need to use that electronic shutter for the silence occasionally in a church I'll need to use it but I use the electronic shutter so infrequently on the X100F that I don't even have it set to a function button. I have complete faith in the auto ISO system and so I set my default sensitivity to 200, my maximum sensitivity to 12,800, my minimum shutter speed to 1 1 25th. This configuration works for me almost all the time. Because I'm shooting people pretty much always I want to use a minimum shutter speed that's pretty quick to avoid any kind of subject blur when people are moving or they're walking by. And I'm happy when the camera pushes the ISO up to 12,800. Part of my branding to my clients, certainly for my wedding work at least, is to have that kind of filmic look to the images. So actually when images are shot at higher ISOs, I have less of a worry about it at all. I'm happy for grain to be in the images. I'm happy for them to appear a little bit noisy at those higher ISOs. Although it has to be said, the X100F is a lot better than the X100T at that high ISO level. I don't think anybody's gonna be using the X100F for professional video production. 
But you know what? It's great to have it on the camera. It's improved over the X100T. The focus tracking is improved. And it's really nice to just be able to point and use one of the film simulations to make a pretty decent film clip. The intro scene to this particular video was shot on the X100F. Literally, the camera put down everything in auto, auto ISO, auto aperture, continuous focus tracking, across film simulation or classic chrome, whichever you're going to use, and away you go. I actually really love making film clips of the kids and just kind of personal stuff. So it's a little bit annoying that there's no longer the option to set the video starting option to a function button. So you have to delve into the drive menu and you have to click that button and away you go. No great shakes, but you know, it's just one of those things. I'm going to discuss now more of the um, custom settings, screen settings, personalization options. We'll start with the display custom settings. This is where you can set up what's displayed on your EVF or your OVF LCD and in the actual viewfinder itself. For example, you can switch off the battery indicator if you so wish, you can switch off the exposure compensation. It's all personal preference, of course, and there's a school of thought that believes actually the more of this stuff that you turn off, the longer the batteries will last. But really, the only thing that I think is important to mention is the histogram, especially when you're using the optical viewfinder. I find that if I'm using the optical viewfinder, I just have to have that histogram switched on. When you move from the EVF to the OVF, you're going to lose your exposure preview. You're not going to see the WYSIWYG type interface. So having the histogram telling you where you're blocking out the shadows or your highlights are going over, I think it's, it's a no-brainer to just have that on in the optical viewfinder. Let's talk about the button and dial settings. Let's start with the focus lever. As I mentioned earlier, I typically focus and recompose. So I have this option set to press to unlock. This gives me the option to use the joystick if I need to, but also it restricts it from being bumped accidentally. On to the all important function settings. You can see that I only use four of the available function buttons. I prefer to have function three, four and five disabled so I don't accidentally bump them with my fingers and it saves me having to lock off the whole of the button setting. I actually move the AFL button across to be used on the rear command dial. I find it much easier to reach. In an ideal world, I would like to be able to use the Q button for my back button focusing. Sadly, we can't do that. Who knows, maybe that's something that will change in a future update. And I know a lot of other people would like to use the position of that Q button for the AFL too. The ISO dial I have set to command. This will allow me to use the front command dial to change the ISO when in auto mode. If I also want to use the extra stops of exposure compensation, I can just press that front command dial in and toggle between using the exposure compensation and the ISO. I have the control ring setting set to digital teleconverter. I use it occasionally, not too often. It's worth remembering that you have to be in JPEG mode, you have to be in single shot mode, and you can reach out to 35, 50, and 75 millimeters. If you're using the physical uh, teleconverter adapters, you can also reach out to 100mm using that setting. The control ring, by the way, is the focus ring on the front. So when this is active, then you'll need to just rotate the focus ring on the front to move between your focal lengths. I like to have my AF lock mode button set to switch. This basically means that the exposure or the focus lock when the AFL button is pressed is going to remain locked until the button is pressed again. Some people like to have it set to pressing, which means that you're going to have to hold the finger down all the time you want that exposure locked. Either way works, and it's completely a personal preference, of course. So there you go. I hope you found those useful. And remember, these are just my settings. Your mileage may well vary. If you did find it useful, please feel free to subscribe to the channel below. Head over to my website, kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk, or my Fuji-specific website, which is f16.click. Leave any comments below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Have a great day.